Uh, welcome to day two of, of the Alliance Conference, and it's wonderful to, to be able to have some something in the morning for, for those, well, morning my time, um, for, for those people who are in different time zones. Um, so my name is Erica Hall, and I work for World Vision, and I will be the moderator for today. Uh, just to give you an introduction to the session, this session is looking particularly at the context of COVID-19 and different mechanisms for protecting children from harm. And we'll focus particularly on two, two great, um, three great programs in Bangladesh and China. So just to go through some housekeeping notes for those of you who were not able to join yesterday um, please keep your microphone muted unless you're contributing during the q a at the end uh, and also keep your camera on if you can um, we're trying to make this as much as possible like an in-person event so it's nice for um, for everyone to be able to see each other. If you don't want to see yourself, you can hide your self view by clicking the three dots next to your name. Uh, also, just to let you know, we are recording the session, so we want people to be uh, feel comfortable to share openly, but also want to be able to make sure that people, as many people as possible, can see these fantastic presentations. So, so yes, here we go. Um, we are going to be using Mentimeter and Group Map during the session. If you're not able to access them, you can put your responses in, in the chat. So don't worry about that. And to ask questions during the session, which I will pick up in the Q&A, there, there will be a link for that has now just gone through into the chat um, for the Mentimeter link for the, for the chat. So I would like to kick off by introducing our presenters today. Uh, I think they're all online now. Uh, so we have Natalie McCauley, who's Chief of Child Protection, UNICEF Bangladesh. Uh, Fatima Karunahar, who's a Child Protection Officer at UNICEF Bangladesh. Uh, Yi, Yi Jang, for, um, Child Friendly Justice, Project Manager at Save the Children China, and Jamila Akhtar, a Child Protection Specialist at UNICEF Bangladesh. So we're very pleased to have all of you on, on the call today, on the session today. Um, so we will begin with an introduction to UNICEF Bangladesh's COVID response work for street connected children. So I'd like to welcome Natalie and Fatima and I think we're, I'll hand it over to you, but I think we're starting with a Mentimeter poll. Thank you so much, Erica. It's really an honor to be here, of course, and with my colleague Fatima. Um, this is uh, led by Fatima, this program um, and project. So um, I guess we can go straight to the Mentimeter, right? Is it up? Yes, I've just put the <laughs> link, I've just put the link for everyone in the chat. Um, if you maybe want yeah. to let them know, um, the question is in the chat as well, and I will bring up on the screen now. Okay, so so what we want to do is we want you to tell us what, if any, programs you might have had for children on the streets during COVID lockdowns. So click the Mentimeter um, website, and then you can um, answer that question. Yeah. We want to hear more from you as well. Because obviously, uh, this is a very hard area to manage we we heard even last year in the annual meeting that this was an area where a lot of people didn't program and you can see that someone's put no um, and obviously from a prevention standpoint um, to put prevention mechanisms in as well as an immediate response to keep these children safe rather than putting them straight into institutions which we know are bad um, is quite challenging so um, this is why we're presenting on our program so we're still seeing a lot of no's. Yeah, no. Okay. Yeah, yeah, adapted an existing program. That's smart. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, we, we sort of adapted an existing program, but we took from not broader emergency response and experience um, to, to make this program. 
that we're going to tell you about. Maybe just one more minute or we can move to the video. I think it's probably okay to move to the video. Yeah. Okay, okay let's great. Go. So we're just going to play a video on the program itself and then we'll have a chat afterwards. It's hard to imagine that children living on the streets could face an even harsher reality. With the shutdown of the economy due to the pandemic, further shrank their opportunities to eke out a living and expose them to even greater risks of exploitation. <laughs> In another part of the city, 14-year-old Ramjan, who lives in a Gaptali bus terminal, found it increasingly difficult to afford food during the months of lockdown. Luckily for Nujahan and Ramjan, social workers from NGO partner Operjo Bangladesh convinced them to go to the Child Protection Services Centers, supported by UNICEF. <laughs> As COVID-19 exacerbated the vulnerabilities of children living on the streets, UNICEF started providing tents to accommodate homeless children in Dhaka, Chattogram, Khulna and Borshal cities. minimum a key aim of the Child Sensitive Social Protection Project is to reunite the children with their families and have them return to their homes. In another slum near Gaptoli bus terminal, 11-year-old Imon is glad that he was brought back home by a social worker. He ran away several months ago out of frustration because his parents could not afford to feed him every day. There are many homeless children living on city streets across Bangladesh. It is critical to expand the services during the pandemic. UNICEF continues to thank the government of Bangladesh for their ongoing commitment to the protection of children across Bangladesh, but in particular in this program, the most vulnerable children living on the streets. It continues to show their dedication and support and it saves lives. So thank you, thank you for sharing the the um, 
video cap is appreciated um i hope everyone got it mine was a little bit distorted at times so i hope you hope you got it um well i want to just present a little bit not to bore you all of course um and uh and discuss basically the basis of of this program so really we had a situation where we had a very um large uh, number of lockdowns um, that started at the beginning of, of last year um, and they continued right up until a couple of months ago where they were on and off lockdowns and this meant there was no services available for children on the street. Um, according to the government there's 1.6 million children living on the street but this is from 2004 so we know that we're in the millions now. Um, we're doing a study this year thankfully um, thanks to the EU and hopefully we'll get better data, but we know there's millions of children on the street. So when the lockdown occurred and there's military on the street, we knew that there was going to be a problem. There was also discussions with um, Department of Social Services and the um, city governments, and they their solution was to, to pick them all up, basically. So we wanted to try to make a different solution that also aligned with the needs of the government but also the needs of the children and our approach to systems building. We saw increases in child labour, child marriage as well as sexual exploitation and abuse and of course we also saw increases in violence and there was really no access to other basic services. All schools were closed until um, from March 2020 until only a few weeks ago. Um, so we had the longest um, run of children being um, out of school. So this obviously also increased um, the numbers of children on the street, but also children looking for work. So our approach was to increase this strengthening in systems and supporting social service workforce. So you'll hear in the second presentation about the child helpline. This was very much linked to this work as well, promoting that helpline, but also that outreach of the social workers, which you heard. And these social workers were government social workers. So initially we did have a partnership with um, an NGO, which was AB, but we've now actually advocated with the Ministry of Social Welfare and, and the Department of Social Services to keep having these child protection hubs under government um, in a more um, systemic way than, than what we've created them in, which basically means it's a one-stop shop um, and we have other sectors involved as well. As you could see, we had nutrition, we had education, we had health. So they're all involved so that we can um, maximise the services and also focusing in on getting these children back home to their families if they're separated from their families and off the street. Um, during the time of COVID, over 2,000 of the most vulnerable children were supported. This number is probably higher now, but they were supported with social workers, case management, psychosocial support, access to food and health services, as well as life skills and more than 200 were traced and reintegrated back to their families. But this is now a model which the government is going to scale up for sustainability purposes. You can see the photo here of one of the boys outside one of the tents. Obviously, there was um, we had to make sure there wasn't too many children in the tents at any one time, but they also learnt a lot about COVID um, and how to distance. Even one of the girls spoke in the video about washing her hands and, and how she, she kept clean. Um, which I think was also a benefit for them. So some of the immediate um, lessons learned was that we needed to uh, we need to have the immediate needs of these children um, met, which were survival needs, life needs. Um, otherwise, many of them may have died or they may have been trafficked or had far worse outcomes. Um, the, the assessment that we have done has shown that these hubs have prevented and protected these children. So that's why there's a scale up option now. Um, and the assessment showed that the hubs strengthened the confidence and social connection for living a safer life, increasing protective behaviours of the children. Um, and it also increased this cross sectorial coordination that I was talking about um, before, where you can see that all the other sectors are involved. So that's it. I tried to stay within the time. I hope I did. <laughs> um, and we'll be back for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Nat. Yes, you, you are well within time, so, so don't worry about that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> if I can, because we still have a bit of extra time, um, can I just ask one question myself as um, taking advantage of my role. Um, 
what I thought was quite interesting is you're talking about working with the government and um, and getting them to to take on some of this this responsibility. And we know in a lot of countries that has been a huge challenge as governments are are struggling with their own budgets and and money has essentially been taken away from child protection and 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 these areas. So how did you make that work? I guess it's wonderful to know. It's still, a, it's still an ongoing process. So um, we have designed a new country program, which starts in January, but we've already really started from the start of COVID. We used COVID as an opportunity, um, which is a funny thing to say, right? Mm. But we used it as an opportunity to, to demonstrate systems building and how effective it is and how cost effective it is for government. We, we illustrated that it was more to put one of those children in an institution than it is to have them in the service hubs. Um, and how much the social workers were costing. So initially at the start of COVID, we advocated with government to increase the amount of social workers um, by 500 and they did that with us. And then on top of that, we also advocated that child protection was an essential and life-saving service, which allowed for this NGO to actually do this work initially, um, linking with government, but initially they did the actual hub themselves to demonstrate the work. Um, while the city was in lockdown. So we, so Fatima had to advocate very heavily to get special permission um, in a lot of these places, which included bus stations and the like, where we knew the majority mm. of children were and where there was no one else coming to because the buses had stopped and things like that. So, okay. yeah, I don't know if that helps. So we're demonstrating as we go, but it's a work in yeah. progress. Thank you very much. Uh, there are some questions that are coming in that I will leave now for the um, for the Q and A. But it sounds like a fantastic um, project, Nat and Fatima. Just wonderful, wonderful work. And as you say, a way of using trying to find a, a positive out of COVID of demonstrating system strengthening. Um, so now we are going to turn over to Yi Jang. Uh, who will speak about another COVID adaptation uh, for child survivors of sexual abuse in China. So over to you, Yi. Thank you, Erica. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Jiang Yi from Save the Children China. Uh, I'm working with Child Friendly Justice Project. Um, and uh, it is truly my great honor to have this opportunity to present uh, the uh, present here. Uh, our project has been working in China to protect the, the uh, child, to protect the, uh, the, ch the children in, uh, in contact with law uh, for 20 years. And uh, uh, it's, my, uh, uh, it's my great honor today to present our recent practice and pilot on One Stop Center and its adaptation in uh, uh, in COVID-19. Uh, now you can see uh, on my slide, uh, there are two figures, uh, one in five women and uh, one in uh, 13 uh, men reported having been sexually abused as a child. Uh, their figure, you may be familiar with the figures, however, it's still shocking. Uh, as we all know that uh, the, the, the child survivors of sexual abuse experience uh, wide ranging and uh, serious consequences that will uh, go through their whole life. So it is uh, critical for us to take action and uh, uh, to make change on this. Firstly, I'd like to ask you one question. Here goes the question. Next slide, please. What words or phrases come to your mind when you think of preventing harm to child survivors of sexual abuse? I also use Mentimeter, uh, so you can go to uh, Mentimeter, use the code on the slide. Next, please. Okay, thank you very much. There yeah, difficult. Thank you for these insights. We always think that preventing harm to child survivors of sexual abuse is very difficult. Any other else? 
gender equality, very good. This is what I will mention about the gender norms. Safeguarding, yeah, very important risk mitigation. Yes, when we're talking about prevention, psychosocial support, yes. Education parents, yes, we know that uh, we make child-centered, but based on uh, family support, safe environment, system strengthening, yes. As we all know that uh, child survivors' needs are comprehensive and we need holistic support to them. Yeah, I see participation, yes, in the child, child protection for sexual abuse. Child participation is very, cru very crucial. Maximize innovations. Uh, I hope that our, our practice here echoes you know, this insight. Referral networks, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Sifting school, yes, it's a way for pre prevention. There's quite a few on there now. It might be difficult to read. Okay. Do, um, do you want me to read a few or would you like to move back onto the slides? Mm, maybe you can select to, to read some more. Yeah, of course. Um, so I have, um, apologies if I've said one you've already said, uh, but I see referral networks, um, community support, um, obviously community, very important. Um, I see um, important psychosocial support, um, never blaming a survivor, risk mitigation, safety in schools, um, providing safe spaces, uplifting protective factors, um, and so many more. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Kat, and uh, thank you very much for participants' insight. Uh, actually, in China, recent years, the society and the government has been making efforts to build up a uh, child protection system. However, uh, there are still a large number of people, a uh, large number of children uh, experience or exposed to violence, uh, including sexual abuse. Uh, so back to four to uh, three to four years ago, uh, when I asked the, these questions in our project, uh, then we sorted out uh, some of the possible harms to child survivors of sexual abuse. Uh, you can see some on their uh, slides, like uh, self-blaming. Uh, child survivors may feel guilty and uh, uh, blame themselves, and uh, they may experience stigma from others, parents, friends, uh, people in community or broader society. Oh, wow. If the abuse is reported to uh, police, the children may be uh, re-traumatized by repeatedly interviewed in different judicial stages, and uh, uh, girl survivors may be interviewed by male, uh, male police. Uh, their statements may not uh, form a strong evidence to win the justice in the end. Furthermore, uh, there were no service and support to meet the uh, child survivors' needs of safety, health, psychosocial support, or justice, etc. Uh, so to uh, prevent those harms, our project initiated One Stop Center since 2018. Next, please. 
uh, I will share uh, the one-stop center practice uh, through three points. First is the introduction of one-stop center. Second is how it achieved prevention at the three levels. And third, I will introduce our adaptation in COVID-19. First, uh, what is one-stop center? Next, please. We initiated our project uh, in Southwest China. And uh, uh, why here? Uh, you can see from the map that Southwest China is geographically very remote area in China, uh, borders uh, Vietnam, Laos, uh, uh, Myanmar. And uh, uh, here it's it is featured as more rural and uh, less developed with diverse uh, ethnic minority groups. Uh, so although our one-stop center is built up in the capital center of this region, uh, there is need to tackle the issues of uh, improper uh, gender-based nor social norm and uh, also the needs of my uh, migrants. Uh, so, uh, the government and also the government and uh, social resources is very limited here. Uh, so we built up our one-stop center, uh, which is a, a both a physical center and a working mechanism with integrated services for child survivors and sexual abuse. Uh, we uh, set up three objectives for the center. Uh, first is to minimize stigma and avoid tree traumatization through child-friendly settings and procedures. Secondly, uh, to enhance uh, the evidence collection effectiveness through one-time place interview and uh, prosecutors' early engagement. And third, to ensure the girl boy survivors, uh, resilience and safety. In the following two slides, uh, I will show you some pictures of our one-stop center and uh, also some examples uh, for our practice. Uh, you can see uh, on the picture, uh, there are, uh, this is here, the child survivors uh, were served here. Uh, when uh, child survivors will uh, get into, will enter into the one-stop center uh, built in a community rather than in the place station. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see from the picture, uh, it is where the place interview is going on and uh, where the health examination is going on. Uh, uh, since the uh, police officers who handle with uh, criminal cases are major majority are male, then uh, we uh, we selected and uh, built up a group of female police officers uh, to uh, for the one stop center to do the uh, child interview. Uh, and uh, you can see from the picture, the two ladies are uh, two of our female police officers at One Stop Center. Uh, they were trained with uh, child rights, child uh, protection, child development, uh, also basic knowledge and attitude of child, uh, uh, child sexual abuse. Uh, and also they know the communication skills uh, with children. Uh, so our police interview always start with the healing statements like, uh, this is not your fault. Uh, and also, uh, sorry, please go back. <laughs> And uh, also the um, uh, and also uh, the like uh, you are so brave to report and thank you very much for support our handling the case. Uh, the uh, police interview will be uh, videotaped and the prosecutor uh, will uh, will uh, simultaneously uh, give advice on the collection of the evidence uh, so that the children don't need to uh, repeatedly interviewed again in later process and uh, the good quality of evidence will help to win the case. Uh, 
Uh, the house workers here, not only for uh, their bio evidence collection, but also for the needs assessment for health support in the future. Uh, uh, One Stop Center cooperated with uh, two hospitals locally and uh, uh, the open the green channels to support the children. Next, please. We also set up coordination and collaboration among government departments and professionals. Uh, there are 11 uh, stakeholders in our center uh, to provide timely and appropriate support to children and their families. Uh, here are two pictures of our uh, multidisciplinary meetings. Normally, we will hold uh, we will hold two meetings to. Uh, to do assessment on um, immediate and long-term needs for the child survivor and their families and uh, to make some intervention plan. Uh, usually case management uh, uh, is provided to the children. Next. I believe that our one-stop center achieved prevention at three levels. Uh, here's our how. Thank you. Uh, in the primary level, One Stop Center uh, provides uh, evidence and uh, help to make a case and win the justice for the child survivors. Uh, so this justice demonstrates that uh, the child, sub, uh, child uh, sexual abuse is recognized by the government and justice as a very serious crime and uh, will be zero tolerated. Uh, this message is very clearly sent out to the public, so the crimes is expected to be curbed uh, to some extent. Uh, then in secondary uh, prevention, our one-stop center uh, in the first place address the secondary harm from our conventional judicial procedures. Uh, in tertiary prevention, uh, one-stop center provides uh, holistic uh, support to the, children, to the children and their families. So the child survivors' safety and uh, guardianship will be enhanced and, uh, child, uh, and the, child, the children and uh, their families' resilience will be built up. Uh, this is very important to reduce long-term impact of the harm from sexual abuse and also help to prevent harm from possible violence in the future. Next, please. Our one-stop center uh, contributed to China's recent uh, revised minority protection law and uh, also contributes to the high level uh, judicial department's policy. Uh, the policy requires that one-stop place uh, to be set up uh, over the country for handling their uh, child sexual abuse cases. Uh, there are already 129 uh, one-stop centers over China by the end of last year. And uh, in our pilot site, over 90% of child sexual abuse incidents being reported to the police entered into one-stop center procedures. Uh, also, according to our evaluation, more than 70% of the children we served demonstrated or acknowledged that their situation becomes safer. Lastly, I will introduce how One Stop Center adaptation in COVID-19. Next, please. During COVID-19 pandemic, as we know that domestic violence and uh, child uh, sexual abuse in general uh, is uh, exacerbated. Uh, One Stop Center also considered the necessary of our, uh, our operation, but also uh, facing the challenges from the pandemic control measures. Uh, then we rapidly made our uh, continuity plan so that to uh, ensure the function of the center uh, at the same time and also to implement best interests of 
child and uh, uh, also there uh, followed the local authorities uh, uh, policy to policy for pandemic control next please here there are some uh, key points of our one stop center continually uh, continuity plan during covid-19 uh, first is that we followed strictly to the infection control measures uh, for example uh, the uh, disinf uh, disinfection of the center space uh, ppe uh, preparation and uh, coordination with the local hospital uh, to make sure that health resource is available to uh, child survivors. Secondly, we operated a mixed mode of services uh, for, uh, to avoid the crowd gathering. Uh, we separated our multidisciplinary representative into two groups. Uh, part of them work face to face at the center and uh, others work remote uh, remotely uh, with uh, also with some adaption adapted uh, working procedure and uh, their working documents uh, case management is still delivered to child survivors but in a but remotely uh, so that to ensure the safety to both child survivors and the uh, service providers uh, at the same time, to ensure the quality of case management, supervision and uh, capacity building uh, are strengthened uh, also remote, remotely. Uh, we also employed greater measures for ensuring confidentiality during remote service delivery. Uh, for example, we implemented more strict uh, rule for information management and uh, sharing online. Our uh, continuity plan took effect in March 2020 until the pandemic has been controlled in the pilot site and uh, the plan is prepared to trigger whenever necessary. Uh, due to our uh, business continuity plan, uh, the minimal disruption to uh, one-stop center daily operation is ensured uh, despite of the movement uh, restriction and the social distancing policy. Uh, the number of reported cases almost doubled compared to the same period of previous year. However, 100 of child survivors reported to the place entered our one-stop center pilot during COVID-19 in 2020. In the end, I will uh, share briefly with you the next steps of our one stop center. Uh, first, uh, as the gender based uh, uh, social norm is still a key driver uh, to a uh, key driver of child sexual abuse. So we are seeking more opportunities to work with communities to um, behavioral, social, and gender norm change. Uh, this is as their primary prevention approach. And also currently the justice system in China is still more appropriate for adults. Uh, so we still continue to advocate the development of a more child-friendly justice system and uh, standards. Uh, also, we uh, will try to strengthen capacity building for social uh, for for social service workforce ensure quality service delivery and uh, pay more attention to uh, to the prevention uh, i will stop here uh, thanks thanks Kat, and thank you all very much for your attention and the time uh, your questions and comments to our one stop center is more than welcome thank you Thank you very much, Yi. It's very exciting to see both, both that the project was able to continue and given the increased demand actually be even more effective um, during, during COVID. And I loved to see the pictures drawn by children in your presentation. That was, that was really nice to see. We do have, uh, we are a little bit ahead of schedule, which never happens. So uh, there is a question that has come in through Mentimeter and it is, how did you name the one stop 
how did you name the One Stop Center to ensure it's non-stigmatizing? And how do you create awareness about the center? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, for One Stop Center, actually, uh, for our project site, we just uh, call it One Stop Center for Child Protection. Uh, it uh, has no uh, uh, no upper bills related to sexual abuse. Uh, mm -hmm. It is one way for us to make it uh, uh, not so special uh, to to avoid the uh, a stigma to the child survivors. And uh, uh, you know, as we already have uh, more than one thousand one stop center in China, um, according to the policy documents, uh, they are all named as one stop center. Uh, however, in each locations, they may have different names, like uh, maybe uh, house of uh, house of what uh, protection house or uh, or flower house, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. Uh, what is another question? <laughs> so um, it was, how do you create awareness about the center? Oh, uh, uh, actually, uh, the, uh, it is uh, actually what we, uh, what we need to do in the next step. Uh, now the awareness of, uh, is not uh, for the public yet. Uh, the one-stop center now is uh, only handles the case from place uh, from those reported to police station. Uh, and uh, but for awareness to the police station uh, to the police, uh, actually we uh, it took us a while to let every uh, every police station to know this. Uh, we uh, first of all we partner uh, with the local uh, police uh, public mm -hmm. security bureau and uh, uh, they are our key partners they um, uh, they they uh, they work as a stakeholder uh, to uh, hold this uh, to build this duty. Uh, once a case reported to the police, every case should enter to the uh, one-stop center. However, it still take a while to implement completely because uh, some of the police officers they don't know very well about the procedures of one-stop center. And uh, uh, then when we notice that there are uh, uh, a few cases uh, not follow the uh, standard operation uh, operating procedure. Uh, then we also work with uh, local uh, uh, with local social work uh, uh, local CSOs and uh, the uh, PSB uh, to have training. Uh, we give trainings to police officers round and round so that each. Uh, in each uh, police station, they know that once they received a case reported, uh, they will go to a one-stop center. Yeah. Great, but it's all, all very encouraging and, and to see how much work uh, is being done with local authorities uh, and police on that. There are a number of other questions that have come in, but for the sake of time, uh, I think we'll continue with the next presentation and come back to hopefully a long Q&A at the end. Um, so okay, thank you. yeah, thanks very much. So now um, I'm going to hand you back to uh, both to Nat and, and Jamila, um, who will talk about psychosocial support being provided through the Child Helpline um, in Bangladesh during the pandemic. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you. you. Yeah, I've just come after a very, very interesting presentation. So now my mind is in that program and <laughs> not in my own. Um, so let me get prepared. Um, so thank you for having us again. Um, and this very much links with uh, the past presentation. Um, just want to make sure you can see my presentation, assuming you can. Yes, okay. So this, this one we're focusing in on now, Child Helpline, and I recall in the first presentation, someone actually mentioned that they um, actually built on and expanded on programs that they were already doing um, during COVID. And this is what we basically did with the Child Helpline. The Child Helpline has been around for, for quite some time. Let me see if I can change that, yep. 
Um, it's been around since 2010. So it's it's been around for a long time. It's a dedicated toll-free number by the Bangladeshi government. It originally was a pilot, um, again, with an NGO and then got scaled up. Um, but it's all been all over the country since 2015 and with the Department of Social Services. It works 24-7 um, and offers a free and confidential telephone and emergency response outreach service. So part of that service is psychosocial support and counselling. Part of it is immediate and direct interventions um, and referrals to appropriate services and case management. So if we look at when COVID actually hit, we needed to think about this because children were in lockdown. Um, they had no way of seeking help. Um, and we were getting an increased number of phone calls um, increasing by the, the day um, at the start of last year. And we needed to look at how we were going to manage the child helpline because there was not enough um, people uh, to man the phones, um, not enough qualified individuals there. So alongside the advocacy for the extra social workers, um, we also advocated for extra call centre staff, for extra training of those call centre staff, and for them to be considered as essential. So we increased the number, we were able to man 24-7, and we improved the outreach and referral pathways to social workers that were considered essential. Part of what was also done was that the, the case workers that were working on the child helpline at that time were even allowed to stay in the building of the ministry because this is, this is actually placed in the ministry. We created a space and helped, UNICEF helped the government with um, temporary beds and um, tea making facilities and, and food making facilities so that they didn't have to leave um, all the time. So we had them on a schedule, a rotation schedule and roster where they would stay for um, two weeks and then they would leave for two weeks um, and they would have special permission to do that. And part of what we also did because they did a lot of rescues, there was over 3000 children actually physically rescued through this process. Um, they had um, the personal protective uh, equipment given to them as well, which was also a hard advocacy point given that the health colleagues also um, wanted to promote their um, component as well. So if you look at the data, um, we actually had uh, we usually only get around 75,000 calls before COVID a year at the, at the helpline. Last year alone, we had 180,000 calls received from the helpline. So it's, it's nearly triple the amount um, and it's still, the graph of this year is looking very similar. So I imagine by the time we get to the end of the year, it's gonna be the same because the Delta um, variant came in around a similar time this year. Um, so we've had similar numbers this year, a little bit down from last year, but pretty much close to the same. And so um, you can see that was just such a high level of increase in phone numbers. More than 70% of these calls were actually related to sexual abuse, exploitation, neglect, physical abuse or physical harm. Um, and we had to do psychosocial support, obviously, but also get these kids to safety and have referral pathways associated with it. What we found quite interesting was, is the majority of calls, more than 60% of the calls actually came from boys. And we think that's because of the accessibility um, to digital, um, to digital uh, forms of communication, whether that be computers, phones, and the like, and that's something that has come up for us and we will we'll take forward um, uh, when we're thinking about this, because obviously girls also need to be able to ask for help. So if you look at this, this is the, um, the on the bottom right hand corner is the old space, um, which I sort of called the cupboard. Um, it wasn't very big. It was one really tiny room. Um, and you can see you couldn't have many call center staff and it's obviously not very uh, COVID friendly at all. And if you see up above, we were able to almost triple the amount of um, call centre staff in any one time. So this was part of what we were um, trying to mitigate was that 26% of the calls were still going unanswered um, to the child helpline. And 
we didn't want to have any breaks. We wanted to make sure that all the calls were not dropped um, despite the lockdown. So we were lucky that we have a very strong partner in the Department of Social Services and the Ministry of Social Welfare. And they were very amicable with all of our suggestions. And I think it was, again, this situation where we took advantage of COVID um, and they needed the help and they needed the suggestions. They weren't sure what to do. Um, so this was what was really critical um, at the time and, and they took our suggestions. But you can see that the old space was quite, um, if you look at this old space, it was quite quite cramped. Yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't walk through or around the tables um, when I went there for the first time. We also have a creche now as well, so that the ladies, the social workers that are female, we're encouraging more female social workers. They can also um, have more support with their families. So what we were looking at really is a idea of this technology plus. Um, and so we're not just looking at um, child helpline and you saw that with that first example that we gave you. Um, we're looking at uh, a broader systems-based approach where everything is interlinking, even if it's not with the same ministries. We had virtual training across the year with over a thousand social workers that were trained and we really promoted um, this look, listen and link approach where really it was about facilitating resources that were available on the ground. Um, and that include resources from other sectors, not just our own. So currently the referral pathways and online management systems are, are being expanded. Um, they're being documented better. I mean, this is again, something positive that's come out of COVID. We're adapting it more at the local level to, so we can ensure a really quick um, an effective referral pathway. Um, and we get the caseload taken up by the local level social workers. We, we only have just over 3000 government social workers in the country. We need over 110,000 if you look at um, the amount of children there are. At the moment, we've got over 40 million children affected by violence within the home every month. And obviously that increases um, when there's lockdown. So that was that was pre-lockdown data. So you can imagine that we're talking very large numbers here and very few um, systems that have been put in place by government. Um, so again, we're very lucky that the government has taken this on and embraced all of these um, ideas. So some of the key challenges that we that we had, um, well, we were Something's gone wrong with my screen. I'm really sorry. I don't know what's happened. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> um, where we we equipped um, the the social service workforce. I mean, this is this is what we have to do. We have to increase massively, increase the social service workforce. But also, we have to make sure that it's a quality social service workforce, so that they actually have. Um, really good training and resources. I saw a, a, a question in the chat before around how are they trained? At the moment, we do have a six month training program, but what we're doing now is we're opening it up with Dhaka University. Um, we're, we're getting international universities to come and support so that the social work degree includes children, it includes child protection and includes the refugee situation in Cox's Bazaar, which at the moment, the social work degree doesn't include. Um, and that it is a, a true social work degree where we hone in on casework, casework management and, and the look, listen and link and particularly the referrals. So we wanna make sure also within our referral mechanisms that the services that we're referring to are actually quality services. And this has been a harder, harder road, but with the social work, with an increased amount of social workers, we're actually seeing increased follow-up. We also need to look at an informal system of social welfare because obviously we can't all of a sudden have 110,000 social workers when there's only 3,000 right now. So this is something that we're actually also looking at. We have 68,000 villages here. So we're looking at how we can do an informal system there. Um, and the promotion of the child helpline is very, very critical. Um, so that children know um, where to go to get help, but also parents know where they can call and ask for support if needed. Um, and that may include um, mothers that are in intimate partner violence situations that are um, affecting them. So um, this is a helpline that, that um, can look at the whole package of a child, the social ecological model of the child, not just the child itself. So 
we're going to continue to promote it that way and presumably that will mean increased calls, but we may have to have more space at the ministry for it. Um, and government really needs to invest the scale up. Now, this is a question you asked earlier, Erica. So this is a work in progress. Um, we're really trying to give them the cost benefit analysis of investing in these um, in these services. Uh, and hopefully over the years, we'll continue to see, we've already seen an increase in investment, but we need to see um, significantly more increase in investment in this area of concern. So um, that's all for the PowerPoint, but I think um, if I'm not wrong, we have a question to ask everyone. Kat, are you there? Yes, it's just been posted in the chat. Um, so the question is, what are the various ways that you've used to reach children and young people with case management and PSS during COVID lockdowns? So that's a group map that I'm going to be um, uh, sharing on the screen right now. It's very easy to use. You just need to click the plus there, type your answer and hit enter. Um, so we'll uh, await some of your responses there and Nat, I'll allow you to, um, to discuss what comes up on the screen. Great, this is exciting. I haven't used this one before. Hopefully it's fairly simple for everyone to get on there, <laughs> but uh, usually takes, takes a second um, to, to okay, update. We've got time, I've been, I've been good with my time. I would like that on record, Erica. <laughs> Can, you can tell Hanny and Audrey that I was on time for once. You have been amazing on time and I'm so excited. We actually have nearly half an hour for questions. Never happens. This is, this is never, this is, okay. Audrey, yes, I want it noted. This has never been seen. <laughs> never on time, not even when I used to deliver training. Okay, so. <laughs> I can't see any brainstorms. Come on, people. We want your ideas. What are the various ways that you have used to reach children and young people with case management and PSS during COVID lockdown? And one of the, the reasons why we're asking this question is because it's particularly difficult. I mean, during lockdowns, particularly the little ones, they've got no way of communicating with us. See, so we're looking at online focus groups, through phone calls. A lot of our social workers also used, phone, uh, used phones. We increased the amount of phones that we gave to them and um, even iPads, not iPads, but you know, the, the tablets um, so they could do their work. WhatsApp and WeChat, I'd be interested to understand that more. We know that in smaller um, rural areas, a lot of people still have access to WhatsApp um, and even WeChat, and that has been very useful for social workers um, to get easy access to people, which is quite interesting. A lot of people in our, in our situation don't have access to the internet, so that, that didn't sort of work for us. So that was um, not as effective for us. We also used Facebook. Um, Facebook Lives to, to give information, but obviously not to do casework. Um, Zoom, virtual safe spaces, mostly through low tech, um, through phone calls. Um, radio, okay, in Nepal, through radio. That's very interesting. Um, there are a few, a few people who've yeah. added in the chat as well. Um, through home to home visits by social workers, using community based yeah. structures, parental sessions. Um, that's coming from Konji uh, UNICEF Ethiopia. And uh, Ari's uh, Burgonio, apologies if I am massacring your name. Uh, and they're saying that it's still, still home visits taking place, but some through Messenger and Google Meet. Mm. And mobile phones, it seems to be a too. Yeah. Individual session skill. So the home visits were very hard for us. We weren't allowed, like our first initial few months in COVID, we really, even the first, literally the first few weeks of lockdown, we had to advocate for social workers to be even allowed um, to go on the streets. Um, so to be allowed to do home visits was a very big step. Um, I know now things are opening up, so it's much easier. Our social workers are doing home visits, but in that initial time, there was no chance they would be able to do home visits. 
Um, the community-based intervention, I think that's a, that's one that has come up a lot. Thanks, Jonas, also to, to mention it in the chat, community volunteers and home visits. Yeah, the community volunteers um, approach, I think, is a, is, is a positive one. It's something that we're also uh, tossing around here because we do have to reach 58,000 villages. So um, it's something that maybe that we can use here. It has worked in many countries before. Only online, first in lockdown. Yeah, it took time to provide training. And it also took time to get access and to get the credibility that social workers were life-saving and essential. Um, mm. So I think I think even any countries with helplines, um, did you also find that your helplines went through the roof and that you couldn't handle all the calls? I'm wondering about that as well. I like the idea of a virtual safe space for adolescent girls. Who put that? That's interesting. Is there someone who someone who put that in who'd like to to speak a bit more about it? Helplines mostly no one was answering the helplines. That's sad. Mm. Yes, if the person who talked about virtual safe spaces in, in the Mentimeter, it seems like there's some interest in hearing more about that. So if you'd like to unmute yourself um, and, and tell us a bit more, that would be wonderful. Okay, maybe maybe that's not possible. Um, they're not right. Then they're they're scared now. We've put them on. I know. <laughs> but maybe Q and A. If you feel encouraged, please please speak up. We did have an. We also developed an adolescent app um, for our adolescent clubs, and we had virtual clubs. So I'm wondering if that's mm. a similar thing. We had some. We had um, adolescents coming together with the the peer leaders on an on an app. So I'm wondering if that's similar. Yeah. But again, I feel feel a bit worried about the kids that don't have that technical access, and and often they're the most vulnerable. Um, and how do we reach them in in this sort of situation? So um, yeah, very interesting. I know I can say for for World Vision, I know in some of our we try to integrate um child protection and, and elements of mhpss into some of the remote learning programs yeah. so so where we were delivering packages of information and and trying to help help that and help support parents uh, as well to try and keep keep these challenges down um yeah, yeah as part of the education programming yeah I, I have seen also a lot of integration with other sectors that did actually were allowed to have access like health um, so that's actually quite interesting also using that virtual learning space as well yeah yeah confidentiality becomes a concern when we rely more on social media platforms yes absolutely gosh there's lots of comments Erica so many Overloaded. comments <laughs> <laughs> Should I um, uh, stop sharing the screen and maybe? Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't sure if you wanted to move on or not. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. So that's it from me. Now over to Erica. And Jamila and Fatima are here for Q&A. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you all so much for really interesting and insightful presentations on both on the the increases in child protection uh, concerns during during COVID, but also the need to adapt existing programming uh, and how we can go about uh, help, help some of the successes in, in doing that. So that's all really helpful and, and also very encouraging to see where, although it's been challenging, kind of getting the government uh, to, to prioritize or, or not deprioritize some of these areas, um, which I know has been a challenge for so many of us. Uh, I am going to go to the, we have 20, more than 20 minutes, because my wrap up will only take a minute. Um, 
for Q and A, which is great. We have six questions already in the uh, in the Q and A in the Mentimeter. So please do add yours in, and I will I, I will go through these and then also look at the chat uh, as well. Um, so right. So the first question to go back. Um, just to, to start with the uh, the hotline, um, can the hotline be used for referral to services before abuse occurs, or is it reports of abuse and violence that children can report? So how and and how is the hotline being promoted in communities? Yes, it can. Um, I mean, I think if. If there's a high risk family um, and someone in the community identifies them, then they can also call the, the hotline. There's nothing, there's a whole gamut of, of phone calls that occur and then the intervention comes through the referral to the social worker. So yes, is the answer to that. Um, a lot of our prevention work is with the social workers and the community um, welfare uh, people, yeah. Did you, did you see, uh, I saw there's quite an increase in calls, but I'm wondering yeah. if there were challenges, for example, um, where teachers might normally have called in, but weren't actually having that face-to-face -face contact with children. So are there, are there gaps maybe in those who normally would call in, but haven't had the that face-to-face -face contact, so didn't weren't aware. Absolutely, I think one of the biggest issues we had at the beginning of COVID is people weren't seeing the kids, right? So yeah. um, whether it be school or community, everyone was locked down and they weren't really allowed um, to go anywhere. So, um, and as I said, we have 89% of children here affected by physical violence mm -hmm. every month. So you're looking at nearly nine out of 10 kids would have been affected by violence the whole time. Um, and, you know, I mean, yeah. So it's a, it's a big, it's a big mountain to climb 40, over 40 million kids. And we're only um, accessing a real small percentage. That's why our systems approach is so critical so that we can look at the prevention component of this. We can look at it through a public health approach um, where we do have these community-based mechanisms where we can come in early with, with messaging um, and social norm change. And I think that's going to be what's critical in increasing the social workers as we move forward. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to get to be able to see all of you and look at two different chats. I'm, find, I'm finding it a little bit of a challenge. Um, there was a question around um, also, there was interesting that someone has put in, in both the chats. Um, so how we're, we're talking a lot about um, prevention um, or interventions for high risk cases, but particularly during lockdowns, but how can we continue and how have we continued? And I think this is for everyone to do primary prevention with parents and communities. Um, you know, in sort of in terms of the, you know reducing those risk factors. So I guess this is a question uh, for all of you. Well, I mean, I can speak on behalf of the. I can even just talk about the ten nine eight number. Um, and what we're planning to do is actually expand it to also be a parenting hotline, um, so that if calls come in, there's a that they can be referred off to the parenting group, which would look at. Um, problem solving any of the parenting problems um, and I think more broadly just the systems based approach will make us focus in on working with families and children and, and communities um, to prevent this um, pandemic which is what it is in Bangladesh yep. for sure um, moving forward um, I can see years coming in so go ye. thank you uh, I think uh, for the primary prevention, it is really important because uh, it's uh, just a root course. Uh, for example, in One Stop Center, actually, I have to confess that we have very limited uh, limitation working on this in the past. However, uh, uh, I, we have some uh, trial uh, in during the COVID-19 too. Uh, I think also maybe also a response to one question from uh, Jonas uh, in the chat box uh, talking about the online sector abuse. 
uh, cost, um, uh, for our one-stop center, the, uh, currently we handle only the cases from uh, reported to the place. Mm -hmm. uh, then for the unreported cases, uh, we, uh, we don't have much access to. Uh, however, uh, we, when we notice that during the COVID-19 uh, cases, uh, uh, increases uh, may, be re uh, may relate it more to the internet, uh, especially when the school uh, resumed uh, to start to have the online courses. So the pepper treaters have more chances to target to child survivors. Uh, then we started to uh, do some prevention uh, activities uh, uh, cooperated with community and education. Uh, uh, we, we have some uh, pre prevention, uh, awareness raising on online safety for children or uh, how to uh, how to strengthen uh, uh, parents safeguarding uh, to the to the children uh, and uh, uh, how to uh, how to protect your, uh, yourself uh, uh, through mm. through online activities for the children. Uh, so we think this can be regarded as some prevention uh, prevention uh, strategy strategies but of course yeah for this part uh, we are thinking of to uh, to strengthen and add elements like gender uh, gender equality uh, 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 sexuality evidence uh, uh, sexuality education to all the children yeah thank you thanks very much Yi. um and i think there was Sorry, I'm scrolling, sc scrolling, scrolling. Um, <laughs> to go back to the um, your first presentation that around uh, the project for street children, um, there there were there are a couple of questions around um, uh, the impact of how many of the children who were who were reintegrated um, with their families are still with their families. Uh, as well as um, were there time limits or criteria for children entering into the hubs. Um, so, for example, as you mentioned, there were COVID measures that meant you had to limit the number of children in there. So, so what happened when it was at its limit? Uh, Tamara, are you there? I mean, I can answer, but I want to involve my team because they're the best team. Yes, on I can. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, go ahead, Fatima. Are you there, Fatima? Sorry. So, yes, I'm here. Uh, the, the, this is, I actually could not hear Erika very well. Uh, she, uh, her voice was breaking. So you were asking about this question, you know, like case managed case workers, how we prevent them from so getting infected? The, no, no, no. There's, there were two questions around one, how many children who were reintegrated with their families are still with their families? Or, or, or has that, uh, have they gone back um, oh, yeah. because, onto the streets? With their, uh, more than 200 children have been, re have been reintegrated with their families. Uh, around them, only five were with excellent families. But all others were with their own, I mean, parents. Either, either parents or both parents. And five of them have been reintegrated with extended families, like uh, uncle or auntie, like that. Mm. And they're still with their families. They, they've not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then the other question was, was around the setup for the um, hubs for, for children entering the hub. So was there a time limit or what would happen if the hub was uh, full? Um, mm, no, there is no, actually hubs are uh, 24 by seven uh, services, two by services. And there was no time limit. I mean, children were enrolled any time. And uh, yeah, there was no time limit. But we had all these uh, protective measures for every child so that whenever a child, a new child is get enrolled, he or she, is, uh, she used to receive all the services, all the sessions on mm. uh, COVID infection and how a child can. Uh, get infected and how he can protect himself or herself from this 
using the protein inhibitors. Particularly, we had all the devices available mm -hmm. for all those children, whoever comes to the service. Um, great. And then the, there's another question around, um, uh, again, it kind of goes back to this idea of how how do we put or are there opportunities to bring more primary prevention aspects into into the project um, for example to identify and address the key risk factors for for street children uh, one uh, key issue that i think Natalie also mentioned that we are uh, supporting government for strengthening social services workforce and uh, uh, these social workers are uh, working with cross sectoral service holders, uh, service uh, uh, providers like health and education, particularly. So during the lockdown situation, it was very challenging. And one key issue is that whenever a social worker closely works with school authorities, uh, we can prevent a school child from dropping out or get back them to schools. So that was one issue. And another issue was during this lockdown situation when school uh, was closed, uh, but uh, at a certain time, after certain time, school, when start, school authorities started uh, communicating with children, that time social workers supported the school authorities. And another big issue that I would like to uh, uh, inform you that uh, while we had this lockdown, our uh, social workers used to uh, take support from police and uh, communities surrounding the services hubs. And most of the children were there actually with support from police and surrounding communities. So they remotely followed up with those communities and police and uh, children, all the time children actually used to get food support at least from government relief and from nearby uh, people who actually were looking after those children in other times. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to hear more about that. Um, another question for, for Yi on the one-stop centers, um, when switching to the hybrid and remote case management and service provision, how did this impact on the quality of service and what was put in place to maintain quality? Thank you for the question. Yes, as we all know that uh, if uh, uh, case management should be best uh, delivered face to face. However, the remote uh, compromise is to suitable for uh, the situation like COVID-19. Uh, in uh, remote case management, uh, there are um, actually for the quality is that case management is very, uh, the important thing is that to uh, really set up a rapport to your to the client, to the child survivor and their families, mm -hmm. and to really engage the child survivor and families uh, to the process uh, of uh, case management. Uh, then, uh, uh, to uh, so if you cannot make this well, uh, then the quality of case management should be damaged. Uh, to some extent. Uh, so in one-stop center, uh, when we have to face with remote uh, case management, uh, we on the uh, first way is that uh, we encourage our social worker to uh, uh, to do uh, case management through uh, like the uh, visual uh, uh, vi uh, visual uh, video meeting or uh, uh, or phone, at least a phone, uh, not only to send messages uh, so that they can see their clients and uh, see, the mm. see the children uh, and uh, also try to have some uh, try to do some uh, micro uh, use some micro uh, uh, skills to uh, to build up the connection with your clients like uh, not to uh, in the first place start your talking but uh, do some interactions as what we are doing here uh, the second thing is that we strengthen the supervision uh, to case management uh, cost uh, during the COVID-19 uh, the caseworker should have more uh, more sense um what's going on with the child survivors uh, and uh, figure out uh, not only the uh, the uh, the psychosocial support needs from the uh, the abuse uh, the sexual abuse, but also maybe psychosocial uh, support needs from COVID nineteen as well. Uh, so the uh, case 
caseworkers should be more sensitive, uh, more set, uh, have more mm -hmm. sense to handle this, and uh, uh, the supervisor should support uh, on this. And also, caseworkers have to pay attention to the security during the, uh, the service delivery. I mentioned that information sharing and management. Uh, and also, uh, for the case management, you have to, uh, you have to choose a safe channel, uh, a safe method to communicate with your clients yeah, and alert yeah. them that sometimes online uh, information uh, communication uh, will have some risk to, to make very cautious. Uh, and also uh, for the uh, caseworker themselves, we uh, gave them more capacity building as well. Um, but the challenge is that our capacity building for a caseworker have to be uh, moved from face to face to remote as well. Uh, so we have many challenges. Uh, you, we, we also have to do, uh, to deal with the, um, how to see uh, to to choose the uh, the 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 course uh, the the package training packages suitable for the uh, for the social worker uh, to have a high uh, better IT uh, support equipment to do so. Uh, but this year was uh, from uh, from last year to this year with our uh, great support from our uh, uh, tech, a technical advisor from Save the Children Hong Kong. Uh, we make this and uh, uh, we think all these are um, uh, what we take as a strategy to guarantee the, uh, co the quality. Yeah. Thank you very much, Yi. Very, very informative. Um, okay, I think I'm going to ask one more question and then ask for everyone to just give their final thoughts. But one last question uh, for this is for Jamila. Uh, in terms of the helpline, what languages is the helpline operating uh, in? Uh, and is it possible for Rohingya and other minority groups to use the helpline? Oh, I'm afraid we can't hear you, Jamila. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, the helpline um, provides services. Uh, I mean, the main language uh, used in the helpline is Bangla. For Rohingya children, uh, uh, there uh, we have uh, someone, uh, our one of our colleagues working in the helpline is from Chittagong, who can understand and communicate, uh, you know, uh, in a moderate way in Rohingya language. So if someone is calling from a uh, Rohingya camp, then the, uh, that colleague uh, is used to you know, reply or attend those calls. So not many children from Rohingya camps are calling to child helpline, national helpline, because at the local level, there are uh, some uh, local level uh, hotlines, which is not toll free, but NGOs are providing that services. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, therefore, uh, the main, uh, you know, uh, stream of the calls are going to those local helpline numbers, but uh, very few numbers are calling to the national uh, helplines as well. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we just have five minutes left. Um, so I would like to uh, ask all each of you, so there are four, four of you, um, so Fatima, Jamila, Nat, and and Yi, if you if you can just take one minute, um, or less if you prefer, uh, to give any final thoughts you have um, before we close. So uh, why don't we start with Jamila since you were already speaking? Thank you. Um, uh, it was very uh, you know exciting to meet all of you here and learning uh, from E, the exciting project on uh, one-stop services. Um, uh, interesting and really uh, very influential. Um, uh, the, uh, as uh, Natalie uh, you know, mentioned here that despite the all challenges uh, during the lockdown, 
we uh, adopted, we tried different ways uh, to remain with the children, to continue our services with, services with uh, uh, families and children. So good thing in Bangladesh is that government actually, uh, through our advocacy government, uh, you know, uh, approved or allowed the social workers, uh, despite the strict lockdown, to visit, to go to, uh, to the uh, communities. And from our side, we tried to provide support to the social workers as well, so that they feel safe, uh, you know, and protected when they go to the communities. We provided PPEs. We we developed a guideline for them on how to remain, uh, you know, safe when they are contacting people when they are visiting communities. So, uh, in different different ways, we try to adopt uh, uh, and uh, you know uh, remain with the families and the children despite all those challenges. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Jamila. Um, Natalie, would you like to go next? Well, I think I'll leave it to, to Fatima and Yi. I think we're, we're short on time, but the main thing is that I got from it um, really is that whole adaption that, that um, Jamila is talking about and using the emergency to our advantage to influence government has allowed us to really create a program that will be focused on prevention um, and will be focused on systems building. So um, just something to keep in mind with other emergencies. I always think it can be an opportunity. I know it's horrible to say that it can, particularly for child protection. Yeah. Absolutely. And thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you. And uh, Fatima. Uh, thank you. I'm really proud of having uh, here with you and sharing my experiences and uh, getting experiences from others, particularly from Jiang. It was uh, very wonderful. Uh, we also were trying to, uh, we have to sort of the sort of uh, programs here in Bangladesh as well. Uh, and uh, we have more scope to address child protection issue in this sort of uh, one-stop uh, service and crisis center. And uh, one big uh, issue, challenge uh, we actually faced in the, the initial days of COVID was that uh, when our children were in the living on the streets and other children who were coming to our different service centers, it was a quite big challenge. And we uh, actually overcome uh, all these challenges uh, with support from our CSO partners, our government partners. That was very good experience for us. And we are still going through a lot many challenges and we are identifying our new strategies as well uh, to cope up with that. And another big issue that is that uh, protecting our uh, frontline workers from getting impacted. That mm. was another challenge. We also coped that with that very well. And uh, only few of our uh, social workers, very few, I mean, less than 1% were actually and got infected, but mostly we they used protective measures and uh, extra measures were also taken for them to uh, protect them from uh, harms and uh, get infected from them. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, very, very important for the safety of, of workers as well. Uh, and Yi, finally. Thank you very much. I have three points. The first is it that thanks very much to the Alliance to give me this opportunity to share what our practice uh, and pilots of One Stop Center in China. And uh, here I learn also from other colleagues. So it's very encouraging that uh, actually everyone's working on uh, protected children and make uh, this uh, mainst mainstreaming child protection in humanitarian action is very important. Uh, secondly, uh, cause, uh, uh, as we all know that primary prevention is really, really re important uh, and uh, we still need to advocate Kate more and uh, uh, harder uh, to uh, to push forward some primary prevention. Uh, for example, in uh, child sexual abuse, uh, the uh, uh, overcome the barriers in cultural gender uh, gender ba based uh, uh, social norm is more is very important. We need to work more on them in the future. Uh, lastly, uh, just personally, I will thank my two mentors. They and grace to support 
us to uh, to submit uh, this uh, project to, to uh, one stop center uh, of China to this alliance. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you. It, it, it's been really interesting to hear so much commonality uh, and so much, um, you know, the need to add, add, adapt, the need to take advantage of what we can to, to strengthen systems um, and, and the challenges of reaching those children who might otherwise be, be left behind when there's so many challenges in a country. Uh, Kat, can you just put up the final slide with everyone's email addresses? Yes, of so course. So if you would like to keep in touch and follow up on any of the conversations, um, there I have put together a slide with with all the presenters' email addresses. This will be in the um, in the resources. Um, so if you don't note them down, you can find them on the resources page on on Philo. And I know we've run out of time, so I'm just I have to remind you that the you have a very long break now, um, but the the sessions start again at 1.30 Geneva time this afternoon. So hopefully some of you uh, time zone permitting will be able to join. Um, and, and thank you to everyone and to the amazing presenters. And it's been a pleasure to to meet all of you and be part of this session. Thank you all very much. Mm -hmm.